We've been joking all week about uh, having a 7 a.m. talk and being like, I can't hear you. Um, it's great to be here, but honestly, I'm normally in Washington, D.C., so it's really great to be any place besides Washington, D.C. What's really neat about the Free Market Medical Association to me is the way that it's been growing and what Jay and Keith have done with the organization. In year one, we were honestly just happy to have people show up. We were happy to have the movement come to a room. And I still see some of the familiar faces that were at that event, and it was exciting. We had a little small room in uh, Oklahoma. I think there was one table that had some papers outside of it. But the, the excitement in the room was palpable, and you could see a movement getting ready to grow. In year two, the event was larger. There was more vendors. There was more people in the room. The discussions had hit a second generation. People were talking about what they had implemented in the year before. They were talking about what they were getting ready to do. And now when we see the organization today and we see, we fast forward a couple of years and see what we have today, um, the organization is growing in numbers. It's growing in diversity. This is a great conference and it's a great movement. And what I think is really fun about it is that we're right on the edge of, I think, seeing very, very large and quick growth. So working on Capitol Hill, um, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to tell you how to practice medicine. Uh, I'm not an admin, so I'm not going to tell you how to set prices. But what I understand are the conversations that are happening on Capitol Hill. And I understand the political landscape, and I understand how that's different than the conversations that we have here today and the hurdles that we talk about in the movement. So what I want to talk about is how I see this movement moving faster. Now, I wrote a book last year, it came out, it's called Profit Motive, Jonathan mentioned it. Profit Motive, what drives the things we do. And the way that I wanna set up, the way that I think we can grow faster is by working in the framework of that book. The idea of Profit Motive is something that a lot of FMMA members understand, but it's that businesses are in business to profit. We all understand that basic idea. What we don't often think about is that level underneath that, and that's that the individuals that are working for that company are also seeking their own profit. They have their own motivations while they're at that company. And interestingly, those motivations don't often line up with the same goals or motivations to profit as the company. The employee, um, you know, they want the company to do well, but they also want to pay their bills. They want to spend time with their family. They want to move up in the company. Maybe they want a better job someplace. They have motivations that differ from the business. So let's look at a simple transaction so we can just all get on the same page and make sure we're thinking about the same thing. So we have a simple trade. Person A trades with person B. Person A makes something, trades it with person B. Person B makes something, trades it with person A. They both profit, simple transaction. But if we move that into something like a college, we can start getting excited about this because it's kind of fun to track. At a college, if you had a simple transaction, I pay Jack Brown to teach me, Jack Brown teaches me, and I get an education, he gets money, we're both happy. Colleges are bigger than that, and so, it actually happens different than that. There's a whole admissions team. There's an admissions staff. So when you go to enroll in college, there's a person sitting there. And that person, it's really like walking into a car dealership. That person that you go and talk to is selling you. They want to get you enrolled. And if they sell you and get you enrolled, it's like a $100,000 car. This is a big deal. It's a big sale. Well, you don't really want to be sold when you're going to college. But you got to go to college, and so you have to make it through this. But if you recognize that that person's goal is to make money and to take care of their family, and it's not necessarily to serve the college by getting you enrolled, you can change their profit motives. And it's fairly easy. You just go, hey, I'm sold. 
I'm sold, I wanna to go to this college, here is my list of demands. Here's what I want before I get in. And you've now changed the, the college administrator's view of life. You're now the one that they're working for. Their motivation is to sell their boss on what your demands were. Now don't be too greedy, don't tell them you want a free education, don't tell them your son wants a free education, your daughter wants a free education. You can save a couple thousand dollars this way just by telling them you're sold and asking for free food, free, free room. But if you've paid attention to the profit motives, if you've paid attention to why that person's sitting at that desk, you can easily save a couple thousand dollars. Now let's make it a little more complicated and start getting a little more personal. If we look at the profit motives of the news. So when you watch the news, what do you see often? You see talking heads. I'm a talking head, uh, and I do a lot of TV. And I'll tell you what, to do TV, it's interesting. You have to usually drive in a downtown metropolitan area. You have to find parking. You have to go in. They put makeup on you. They do your hair. They've sent you five different issues that you're possibly going to talk about. You're only going to talk about three, but so that you don't look dumb, you have to research all five. You don't know how this conversation's going to go, so you're playing all the different ways in your head, and you go and they put the bright lights on, you sit in a chair and you stare at a screen. You get eight minutes of airtime, and then you're done. Well, that's taken a lot of time, because now I have to drive home. It's an hour and a half usually out of my day to do a TV hit. Radio is a little bit less, but they still send you five topics. You talk about three. Um, it's only another eight or 15 minute interview, um, but you've still spent 45 minutes for that eight minutes. And here's the kicker, I've done it for free. Nobody, they don't pay me to do that. The people that pay me to be on TV are my clients. They're the people that are paying me so I can pay my mortgage. And what does that mean for you? That means that when you're watching the news and a talking head comes up, unfortunately me sometimes, um, you're going to hear something that isn't necessarily the news. It's something that I've actually either been paid to say or something that I'm saying in an attempt to get another client. Now, I'm friends with Keith Smith, and Keith Smith would kick me out of the room if I did it exactly that way. It turns out that I've found a, a reasonable uh, career in Washington, D.C. by going after things that I support, and then people coming in and finding me to continue supporting me in that direction. But that still doesn't mean that I don't have a motivation when I'm on TV. That doesn't mean that I haven't been paid. And I don't think that that's the worst of it. The worst of it is that when you're here listening to the radio, Rush Limbaugh is a good example of this. Number one radio show. And he's a firebrand. He can say anything he wants. But there's a think tank. It's the Heritage Foundation. And all of the think tanks do this. So I'm not picking on the Heritage Foundation. Um, they, other think tanks just don't have as much money as the Heritage Foundation, so they can't buy the number one radio show. They buy the other radio shows. Um, the Heritage Foundation pays Rush Limbaugh at last check, it was a million dollars a year, so that they would talk about their studies. So when he mentions a study on air, he doesn't talk about CEI. He doesn't talk about AEI. He often doesn't talk about Brookings. He talks about a study from the Heritage Foundation. I don't think that this is scary necessarily. When you watch Fox News, you know that they have a political lean. When you watch CNN, you know they have a political lean. When you watch MSNBC, you know they have a political lean. And when we watch that and understand that, you can filter it. What's important to me is if you understand profit motives and you understand not some, somebody's not going to do something for free, that when you're watching that, that you understand that the person talking is motivated in a certain way. Uh, Dr. McCary spoke yesterday about the health screenings and he taught, called them the predatory 
health screenings that he witnessed in uh, Baltimore. Well, that is a profit motive of the health screening. The fact is, is that doctor was in there for a reason. They weren't just in there to, you know, spend time away from their family for the fun of it. They were doing something. And I don't think all health screenings or everything like that needs to be predatory. <clears throat> I think that you can do it for marketing. You can do it to build your practice. You can do it to build the word of maybe a disease that you want known out there. But you're doing it for a reason. And if somebody is going to come participate in it, they should ask themselves, why is this person here? If you're building up uh, the idea or knowledge of a certain disease, if you're building up knowledge of a problem, then you can let people know that. You're not going to have an ask. But as soon as you get asked for something, you're going to know that there's uh, a difference there. All right. Now let's get a little closer to what we're talking about. Bureaucrats. Now I know this might be a shocker, but bureaucrats aren't always motivated to do the right thing. <laughs> it's actually kind of amazing to me um, when you start looking at policies or uh, when you start looking about people that are pr pushing for larger public policies that they don't think about this. But there's no possible way that they could understand that bureaucrats aren't necessarily motivated correctly and propose some of the proposals that they do. So let's take a program, okay? Let's take Medicaid. And let's just assume, you gotta follow me for a second here because I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk in and you're gonna shake your head for a little bit. But let's assume that the idea of taking care of the poor is a good idea. And now let's fully suspend belief and say that the policies underlying Medicaid are the right policies, are good, they're actually going to help take care of the poor. All right, to implement that policy, a bureaucrat is going to need to implement the policy. A bureaucrat's going to need to step forward and do something with that. But they're sitting behind their desk. And when they're sitting behind their desk, they aren't thinking, oh, I want to go take care of the poor. They might be thinking that. That's a part of their chain. What they're really thinking is, I need to pay the mortgage. I need to spend time with my family. I need more power. I need a better job. And none of those motivations align with their job. In fact, to do a good job for a government program, uh, Ronald Reagan has some uh, great quotes on this, but to do a good job at what they're doing, they need to sign people up. So let's keep our suspended belief and say that they're still doing the, the right thing and a good thing. They need to sign people up for this program. Well, who do you think the easiest people to sign up for are? Do you think that they're the neediest for the program? No. The neediest in the program are the hard ones. They take the most time. But do you want to go to your boss and say, look, I enrolled three hard people today? Or do you want to go and say, I enrolled 50 people today? You know, you take out easy out of that. And the worst part is, so if we have the perfect program, it still won't work. And we know that these programs aren't perfect. The policies are wrong. The idea that government can come in and save people is wrong. It just doesn't work that way. It gets worse. Eh, I don't know if it gets worse. It's different when we move to Congress. The average age of a Capitol Hill staffer is 28. As a, they're the people that are writing this policy, by the way. This is what's scary to me. But uh, the average age of a Capitol Hill staffer is 28. This is their first job. They don't own a home. They don't have a family. They're well-educated. They're alphas. They're working for a little bit amount of money. They love what they do. And then they sit behind their desk. And they have the same motivations that the bureaucrat had. They want a better job. They want more money. They want a home. They want a family. 
They want to go out and drink with their friends. They want to be able to afford to go drink with their friends. There's actually a joke on Capitol Hill that, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've been to Washington, D.C., we have the double-decker tour buses that drive by, and there's a, a joke that they should, like, pause next to Capitol Hill and, like, throw food to the interns because they, they don't make enough money. And the joke really is sad because it wouldn't be the interns. It would be, like, about halfway up the staff chain, like, please give me food. It's a weird place. But the thing is, and the problem that I see, and this is where we start walking into it, is that the people in this room aren't the ones that offer the staff those goals. We're not the ones that offer them the next step up. Guess who it is? It's the insurance association. It's the hospital association. It's the AMA. These are the people that have the staff on Capitol Hill. They're the people that are walking Capitol Hill. They have the budgets. They're paying high dollars. To these, it's the lobbyists that are up there with the money. They, and the staffers are like, you know, it's like lust in their eyes. Oh my goodness, I don't have to live with five people. I can actually buy a house and afford a wedding. This is the most amazing thing ever. When we move to politicians, it still doesn't get much better than that. So politicians, and I'm an optimist. I think that some people look at politicians and see them as corrupt. I see, I see staff as moving to Capitol Hill because they love America and they want to make a difference. And that's on both sides of the aisle. I don't think that it's a political, a political thing. I think you move to Washington, D.C. and you work long hours because you want to make a difference. I think you sit behind that desk and you realize that your motivations might not exactly align with that. When we move to politicians, I think the same thing. Yeah, I mean, we've got some people that move up there and they're corrupt. I think that they were born corrupt and they just end up in that place. I think that it, it might encourage corrupt people to run for it, but I think the majority of people, the majority of politicians in Washington, D.C. mean well. I think that they run for office to make a difference. And then they get into office. And then there's these structural hurdles in their way from making a difference. First off, the job of a freshman congressman is to become a sophomore congressman. It isn't to change the world. It's not to pass a bill. It's not to help pass a bill. They aren't looking for your help. The job of a freshman is to become a sophomore. That's because uh, like a small business, your odds of staying around after becoming a sophomore dramatically increase. The party has invested in getting you up to Washington, D.C. They don't want to lose you. So you spend all of your first term fundraising. You get elected, you go right back to campaigning. You go right back to raising money. You go right back to not just raising money for yourself, but raising money for leadership, raising money for the party, raising money for other people. But it doesn't even change when you move up because you have to keep raising money. And guess what? We're not very good at that either. Uh, Pete Sessions, uh, one of my favorite guys, I don't know, he, he lost his last re-election um, right here. Um, but if you ever went to his office, uh, he understood um, profit motives. I used to say he ran the Apple store of uh, Capitol Hill. He never turned down a request for an internship. So in the summer, he would have 50, 60 interns running around his office. It was crazy. It was pandemonium. But the people requesting internships with him were his constituents. And he cared and he had him up here. But Pete Sessions tells a story. He went to go meet with the doctor. And he went to his office. And I know it wasn't Keith's office. I've been in Keith's office. This office was mahogany. It had a putting green. It had pictures of big game on the walls. It had fluffy leather couches. And he spoke to the doctor for an hour about public policy. And at the end, the doctor was like, all right, Chairman Sessions, I'm going to write you a check. And he wrote him a check for $250 and sent him out. Now, $250, it's real money. It's not really anything to laugh at. 
but Pete Sessions needs to raise a million dollars. And if you're spending an hour to raise 250, you're not going to make it there. You have to raise money, you have to do your job, you have to spend time with your family. You need to figure out how to make this work. Explain how it works. I attended an event, I was working for a free market healthcare organization. They had a PAC, a political action committee where I could, uh, they could write checks and give them to candidates. It was a small PAC. They usually gave $500, $1,000. And I went to an event and I had a $10,000 check in my hand. I was feeling pretty cool. I'd never had, I'd never been to a PAC event because that's just not the type of people that I worked with and for. So a $10,000 check was a big deal. I walk in and I'm like, this is great. $1,000 entry to the lunch. I beat that by 10 times and I put it down. And before the fundraiser could actually pick it up and put it in the folder, a $20,000 check came down on top of it. That's what we're fighting. That is what we aren't good at. And I don't think that that $20,000 buys corruption. I don't think that that $10,000 margin buys corruption. What I think it does is it buys an ear. It buys time. Pete Sessions wants to raise a lot of money. Who's he going to spend time with? Is he going to spend time with the guy who's giving him $250? Or is he going to spend time with the guy who's giving him $20,000? Now, Pete's kind of weird. He was a fundraising animal. Um, he used to travel the country um, doing it. And I happen to know that he did it from a lot of private sources. Most people in Washington, D.C. don't. That's not the way it works for them. In this conversation, and the way that the profit motives work there, the ways that they're paying attention to where that money's coming from so that they can also do their job and so that they can also spend time with their family and be a human, that shaped policy. So when we look at healthcare policy, it's not a wonder that insurance companies are built into the structure of the system, that hospitals are built into the structure of the system. I wrote a bill for Pete Sessions, and in case you're wondering about my talents, the bill was called the world's greatest health care plan. I didn't name it. Uh, Pete named it. Uh, I do happen to think that it was probably the world's greatest health care plan, because, uh, you know, what are you going to tell me, that it's not? I just show it to you. It was. It was a good plan. It was the first plan post-Obamacare to be introduced in both the House and the Senate. Uh, I spent a year writing it. It was me, John Goodman, um, a healthcare staffer for Pete Sessions, and legislative counsel on Capitol Hill. I had to argue with everybody every step of the way. His chief of staff got kicked out of the room several times while we were debating the bill. I had to fight with legislative counsel that ideas were possible to put in the bill. And even at that, not in the bill. Health sharing, not in the bill. DPC, in the bill, forced price transparency. These are all things, well, I guess they're whatever. I don't want forced price transparency and I want these other two things. And I tried to go to the mat forum and we couldn't do it. There's no way to get the votes we needed. Uh, I had a senator stop me, or the senator uh, that we were working with actually put in the forced tri price transparency. Uh, when I tried to put in uh, health sharing, um, they pointed at these other bills that had all been stripped out of by leadership. And uh, DPC was just sad. It was, uh, I, I was mad. But I'm on the good team and came out with a bill that I spent an hour, a year working on and it still wasn't the right bill, although called the world's greatest healthcare plan. I feel like I need a tattoo on, on me for that one. Um, but I'm not the only one. Uh, some well-meaning people uh, tried to push DPC legislation last year. I wasn't paying attention to it when it started moving and um, nobody contacted me when it started moving, and that should signal a problem with the bill. Uh, I know Dr. Lee Gross, I know Dr. Josh Umber were on Capitol Hill, 
And I know that they had been talking to these people, but again, they weren't the people that they were raising money from and they weren't the people that were going to hire them. So when they wrote the bill, who did they think of to reach out to for expertise? The people over here that can possibly give them the jobs and money that they needed. The DPC bill came out awful. I think I, uh, I called Keith, I called Josh, I called Lee, I talked to um, Phil Eskew, and I was like, all right, I'm coming in. What's going on? What can we do? Is this savable? I think there was five major issues with the bill. I think we were able to save three of them, and I just couldn't educate Capitol Hill on the rest of them. But I only did it because I cared about the issue, because I thought that if they passed this bill as it was, we would kill DPC where it sits, because Congress was going to incentivize a bad form of DPC. They were going to change the market completely, and we wouldn't see the free market grow the way that it should. All of this adds up to the fact that we need to leave Washington, D.C. behind. We need to stop paying attention to them. We aren't playing their game. We aren't the right size to play their game yet. But here's a secret too. They're scared of you. They're scared of change. They're not as nimble. They're not as agile. They're scared. So we can beat them. And it's been done before. As a part of my job, I work with entrepreneurs. So I know the, uh, uh, the father of managed hosting. I call him the granddaddy of GoDaddy. But he's one of the founders of the internet. Uh, he uh, graduated college, realized that nobody was getting email. So he then started providing people email. Great entrepreneur, right? People weren't getting this, they liked it. I can provide that. Done. So one day, the uh, Library of Congress calls him up and says, hey, can you put a Unix server in our system? And he's like, sure, do you have a Unix system admin? And they were like, we don't know what you just said. And they go, well, can you hire a Unix system admin? And they're like, maybe in a couple of years? And there was this pause on the phone because there's a standoff in information. And they go, well, can you host the website for us. And he was like, hold on a second. And he ran in to this back room and was like, hey, how much would it cost for us to host another website? And I guess at the time there was two engineers working for him and the old guy instantly got it and hit the small guy, the young guy in the room and was like, uh-uh, don't say it. And the young guy was like, oh yeah, it wouldn't cost us anything. That was the birth of managed hosting. That's how all of us have our websites hosted on somebody else's server now, was that little question and that little conversation. So that's not the important part when it comes to this, but I think it's a fun background story. The fun part is that now this guy in the Silicon Trailer Park of Laurel, Maryland, right? This is not Silicon Valley. He was above a Chinese takeout shop in Laurel, Maryland, with an air conditioning unit that failed one day and their only savior was a credit card that hadn't been activated yet by the only person working for them that had good enough credit to have a credit card. That was the only thing saving this company and yet they built this behemoth of a company that went public and then was bought by Verizon. It's what we now know as Verizon Business. In the way he was able to beat Verizon, the way that he was able to beat the Bells, the way that he was able to beat the big companies was that they weren't agile enough, they weren't nimble enough, and they couldn't keep up with him. Does that sound like something? This is the way that markets work. This is what we can do. Uber, same thing. Uber kind of depresses me when I think about our movement a little bit because we, if we were a different market, you know, 
we might be able to have that sort of growth. We have a longer sales cycle. So the thing with Uber, Uber did the same thing. You, you have all heard of gypsy cabs. Gypsy cabs were dangerous. They're dirty. You don't know what's going to happen when you get in a gypsy cab. And today we're like, oh my goodness, what gypsy cab's going to pull up? This is exciting, right? It's a different world. And that's because somebody put the gypsy cab on the internet and now it makes sense. But the fact is, is you could tweet, I'm getting in my first Uber and it could go viral. 10,000 more people had that app instantly. Uber grew so fast that the politicians couldn't protect the taxi unions the way that they protect, protect labor unions. It grew so fast that the taxis didn't even know what was going on. They weren't agile, they weren't nimble, they couldn't adapt. It's a trend. That's what I want us to do. It's what I want us to do and grow. And the fact is, it's gonna take a little while. But I think when you're talking to people, when you see the growth in this room, and we hear setbacks, but the fact is, is all movements, they go straight across and then there's growth. Somebody's trying to draw a different graph. The fact is, is they haven't zoomed out enough. When you zoom out, all movements, flat graph, and then go. Look at the wealth of the history of the world. Flat graph, hundreds of thousands of years. All of a sudden, it goes up. Inside that graph, though, it doesn't always look that way. Got Bill Grant down here. He's a believer. He's doing the right thing. He's right next to my hometown. He's had setbacks. So he's going along and he's going up and things are going good. And then the hospital sues him. You know, certificate of need. They want their, they want their beds back. It's a setback. It's a loop. It's iterative. Inside of this movement, it keeps going around. Right? The goal is to learn from each of those and keep growing. That's the way we're going to beat DC. That's the way that we're going to build this movement. What we're going to do is make it so that they have to listen to us. We're going to be Uber. We're going to be Verizon Business. We are going to be the entrepreneurs that don't pay attention to Washington, DC. You keep your heads down and you run as fast as you can. Don't turn your backs on the crooks, though. They'll, they'll stab you. So pay, talk to them. Just don't believe that they're, don't beg them for help. So I was here in year one, uh, and the speech that I gave closed the conference, and there was a shirtless guy dancing on the video. And I don't know if you've seen it. If you want to Google it, it's shirtless guy dancing leadership video. If you don't add in leadership, whatever, have fun on the internet. <laughs> so shirtless guy dancing leadership video. It's a shirtless guy dancing. He's just crazy, waggling out there by himself. Over the course of this three minute video, there's 10,000 people out there with him and they aren't doing an uncrazy dance, they're all mimicking his dance. In year one, I called Keith Smith the shirtless guy dancing. I think that realistically, we are all kind of that shirtless guy dancing still. We're all on the frontier. But I think that FMMA is also the inflection point in this graph. I think that we're getting ready to take off when you listen to the conversations, they're different than they were in year one. They're different than they were in year two. I wasn't here in year three, and now we're here. The conversations are big. I'm excited. Please continue to build your businesses. Please continue to be you. Please do not beg Washington, D.C., uh, I promise I will do my best to let them know what you're doing.
Thank you all very much. All right, Charles, you're not going to get away with <laughs> get away with not taking questions. Oh, I got turned off. There we go. I didn't pitch my book. Profit motive outside. I like it. Grover Norquist calls it the Ronald Reagan of economics books. It's a good endorsement. I wrote it though, so. <laughs> they don't have time. So if you want to, this is the deal. Profit motive is a fun idea when you start applying it to the world. So Grover Norquist is a busy individual. If I want Grover to do something, the easiest way to get him to do something is to do it for him, right? And so I thought for a second, I channeled Grover, and if you look at Grover's website, everything that he says is the blank of blank, the blank of blank, you know, he's the, the wizard of talking points. And so I was like, hmm, what would sell a book? Ronald Reagan would probably sell a book. So I'm the Ronald Reagan of economics books. And it turns out, <clears throat> Washington DC is a small place. I know his staff very well, so I sent it to his communications guy. Grover laughed when he read it and said, that's funny, it's good to go, and let it go back out the door. So it cost me a bottle of scotch to his PR person. Hello. Hello. Um, thank, thank you for your uh, insight, it was great. Um, as we're going along this flat line, yep. I'm comparing it to your story about someone's gonna need a credit card to pay a bill. Yep. What do you foresee as the movement takes a turn up, the resources or the challenges um, in your eyes? What do, what do you see as the problems that we're going to encounter? Yeah, I, I think Jack talked about it yesterday a little bit on the individual side. It's how are you gonna get across that chasm of despair? It's the, um, in the, the answer is, and he was talking about it on a, a kind of a micro business level. I think that it's the same on a movement level, but on a movement level, I get to wave a wand uh, when I talk about it because I think that the thing is, is the further you move out from it, we're gonna drop some people off. There's going to be failures as we move into this zone. And because we're actually doing this, so I mean, look, this, this room has grown, it's uh, tripled, quadrupled in size. I don't know what the full membership of FMMA now is, but I'm assuming that that's even larger. But the line is still, I would call it flat, right? When you, when you look at the kind of the macro market. When we hit here, we're not going to be doubling and tripling. We will be moving up by you know, 1,000%, 2,000, 10,000%. So we're gonna drop people off. I think that there will be investors that'll come in as soon as you hit here, then people will come around and see it. And I think that that's where the three pillars are going to start coming in because there's a question of how exactly do you follow the free market when the business starts picking up because the, the incentives to go in different directions start becoming bigger. So the goal there is that if FMMA is the inflection point, that FMMA is the moral driver of that because we know that if we get off of this highway, and the cool thing about this flat graph going here is if you're on it, it's not a flat graph, it's a straight line, right? You're running on the line. And the goal is that FMMA has created that line so you know the lane that you're running in. But I, I think it's a good question. I think that there's going to be, um, you know, we're gonna have friends come into the room. They, we've already done it. Uh, people have come into the room and left. We've had people come into the room, struggle and stay in the room as we grow in numbers, that's going to become more, uh, more of a deal. Hi, my name is Joshua Blackwell. I'm a medical student in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I've heard a few kind of conflicting viewpoints on this this weekend, uh, and since you mentioned it, um, what would you say are sort of the downstream negative effects of forced price transparency? Um, I just wanted your opinion on that. Yeah. Uh, Forced price transparency is really not price transparency. I, I call it more of the like Bernie Madoff effect. 
um, you know, the government came in and inspected Bernie Madoff several times and gave him a, a green, green light. What you were doing is right. And it wasn't. But everybody believed that since the government came in and checked off on what he was doing, it was right. When Keith first flew up to Washington, D.C., it might not have been the first time. It might have been the second time. Um, but either way, he got off, and the first time I saw him, I, I don't know whether he came running down giddy down the hall, but he had a paper in his hand, and it was the Oklahoma hospital next door to him that had been fighting with him listed their prices in the paper. Um, and like half of those prices matched his prices to the dollar. But they all had, I don't think I've seen a, a graph like this before. They all had an asterisk next to them. And the asterisk was like, might not be the full price, you know? So they listed their prices, but there was other prices. Um, basically, I, I think that uh, when you do a price that way, you're codifying a bad price. Realistically, if we do that, we codify the high price. And there's argument in the movement. Um, I'm on a large healthcare email list and I fight with a, uh, a doctor, I think out of Texas, um, all the time on it. And he helped pass uh, price transparency legislation that forced people to list prices. Um, there's some ways that I think if you listed some Medicaid prices or Medicare, if you're taking those, um, maybe that does something and doesn't get in the market, but I'm, I'm pretty much a purist on it, where as soon as the government comes in and tells you to do something, that it, it's not gonna work. We have one more right oh, here. Oh, uh, Charles, yeah. Hey. hey, yeah, Robert Berry, uh, I got a DPC, talked yesterday with you. Yep. Um, I think one way maybe to um, um, cause this movement to grow, at least in, in, in my area, there is a, there's been a horrible merger of hospitals, it's called uh, Ballad Ballad Health, yep. and I just tell patients I'm the unballad, and they and they get that automatically, yeah, because of how badly they've been treated by the hospital system uh, about the their cost, yeah. So it's almost like we can grow by showing that we're not them, um, I, and, and uh, I think I think that would register with a lot of people because a lot of people have had those experiences with hospitals, large medical groups, and uh, they can understand that. Look, there's a lot of people that I've talked to over the years that have hate the government, but then call for the government to fix a problem. Uh, Rick Scott out of Florida just proposed price controls on um, drugs. Um, we have people that have proposed um, breaking up uh, hospital systems. Um, I think the best way to beat them, and I think there's legislation on Capitol Hill that in, does do things wrong. We, you know, hospitals get more than surgery centers for doing the same thing. Um, I would like to pay hospitals. The weird thing about Capitol Hill is that most surgery centers are asking to be paid the same as the hospital for that. What we need to do is bring the hospital down to the surgery center price and then, we're, and then we're good. But again, we're not to that point yet. I don't think that we can get that across the line and if we're going to go try it, the problem is they get their hands in there and they mess it up before it's done right. So what we need to do is grow and then we fix that. And when we fix that, now not only have we built this movement and we're taking them over and they're not agile or nimble enough to fix it, but we built the movement and now we crush them. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Charlie, I'm of the mindset that we owe a debt of gratitude to like the um, Q Lyances of the world that have kind of died on the hill. Um, you mentioned venture capital and, and bad incentives flowing into the movement, corrupting the movement, and all of those kind of of distractions or temptations. How do you see us avoiding those things? Is there any pearls of wisdom? For me, it's just always call up Keith Smith and ask him what he would do. <laughs> uh, 
the deal is you always have to go back to the profit motives of what you're doing. The thing about taking an investment is that when in the, uh, if you've watched Shark Tank, they'll say this sometimes. Um, when you take money, they say you don't want to take money. Taking money is going to turn this business into an animal that you don't want. The thing about taking money is now you have a fiduciary responsibility to, to make money. And if you make a decision not to make money, which you can do, you have to have a really good reason not to do it. But often in the market where we currently sit, you have to make lots of decisions not to make money. And when you're making lots of decisions not to make money, the money that came in and invested in you is likely going to kick you out because that's not your goal. Your goal is then to make money. So how to do it, that's the hardest part. This is like, I'm not a, I'm not a true believer in the, you know, I don't know. I'm a true believer in our movement. I'm not a true believer in business ethics. Um, I think that when you're in business, you're in business to profit. And if you move in an unethical way, then that hurts your profit because somebody will eventually find that and um, that'll become a problem. But this is the question that I think is the business ethics question. It's how do you follow this line? And honestly, we have the pillars. I think you follow the pillars. Um, I think that you also just pay attention to your business. And if you're true to your patients, and if you're true to keeping that relationship so that other people's profit motives don't seep in. If you're with a patient and you're thinking about another client, it's kind of like being with your wife and thinking of another girl or something. Like, you need to pay attention to the client. As soon as something gets in the way of that relationship, that's a problem. And so if you're growing and you take that money, maybe that's a part of your agreement, is nothing's going to get in the way of this relationship. All right, would you join me in thanking Charles Sauer for his Thank talk you. today? Thanks.